He was once known as the Teflon Don for his ability to avoid criminal charges. That is until 2004. A notorious Quebec mob boss who has been keeping a low profile appears to be emerging back into the limelight. Revenge doesn't have a statue of limitation. Put it all together and it seems like a gangster movie, but that's Vito Rizzuto's life. What's next for the notorious crime family? Hey guys, in today's video we'll be talking about the story of the Rizzuto crime family based in Montreal, Quebec, and more specifically its the most famous figure and probably Canada's most notorious gangster of all time, Vito Rizzuto who was said to be the most powerful gangster in Canada for decades, with his organization even dealing with billions of dollars. Let's get into it. The story of the notorious Rizzuto crime family starts with Vito Rizzuto's father, Niccolo Rizzuto. He and his family emigrated to Montreal in 1954 when Vito was only 8 years old. And in the 1970s, Niccolo established the Rizzuto crime family organization as part of the Sicilian faction of the Montreal Catroni crime family, which he was actually an underling of at the time. The Catroni crime family had strong links with New York's Bonanno family and controlled majority of Montreal's drug trade, meaning that they could help the five New York crime families turn Montreal into an international drug importation hub. Although the Catroni family's influence in Montreal was expanding throughout the 50s and 60s, it started going downhill in 1972, when the leader of the Catroni crime family at the time passed away to cancer. This meant that the two people most likely to take over control of the family were Niccolo Rizzuto and a man named Paolo Violi. Basically, the Catroni crime family was made up of Sicilian members and Calibrian members, and they both wanted control, so the two rivals started trying to get rid of each other. Due to this, a power struggle emerged between the Calibrian and Sicilian factions of the family. Eventually, the power was given to Paolo, yet the tensions between the Sicilians and Calibrians were growing, and Niccolo started doing work on his own and kept money away from the rest of the family. But things really got taken to the next level when Paolo put a hit on Niccolo's life, which ended up being unsuccessful. From this point, Niccolo went to Venezuela to meet up with and align with other drug traffickers. From here, Niccolo would begin retaliating, causing a deadly turf war with the Calibrians. During this time, Polo did a brief sentence in prison and when released, refused to leave the city, even though he knew he would be a major target. He would eventually attend a card game at an ice cream shop he had connections with, and according to a Toronto Star journalist, Quote unquote, not long after he sat down to play, a man reportedly leaned forward and gave him a traditional kiss of death on the cheek. An instant later, a masked gunman shot him twice point blank in the back of the head, ending his life at age 46. This allowed the Rizzutos to overtake the Catronis and become the most powerful crime family in Montreal after the turf war in the mid-1980s. And two years after they took over, the Violi family was finally finished, when the last Violi brother, Rocco Violi, was shot and killed through his kitchen window with a sniper shot in front of his wife and kids. This is actually against the Mafia Code of Honor that involves not to include an innocent family. On top of this, only three months prior to this incident, he was shot with a shotgun by a man on the back of a motorcycle, so they clearly really wanted him dead and weren't going to stop until he was. So you now know the backstory of Niccolo Rizzuto, the man who started the Rizzuto crime family organization, aka Vito Rizzuto's father. Even though Niccolo obviously played a monumental role in their organization, with him founding it and bringing it to the top spot in the city, Vito was a man who took the family into new levels and is the most famous figure in the family, and one of the most notorious gangsters in Canadian history. Now let's get into his story. In 1981, the Rizzuto family was undisputedly in control of Montreal's underground organized crime scene and had tight connections with the Bonanno family. However, the Bonanno family had a problem. The leader of the Bonanos at the time explained to Niccolo, the leader of the Rizzuto crime family at the time, that three underbosses were planning to overthrow him and take over the family. To this, Niccolo responded by agreeing to handle this issue for them, by sending his son and some other associates from Montreal to New York to deal with the three underbosses. This was a way to show their loyalty to the New York families and to create an even stronger relationship between the Rizzutos and the Bonanos. And of course, Vito and two other Montreal Sicilians did indeed handle the issue, and Vito got praised by the five families for this. From here, things were looking up for their business, since they were involved with essentially every form of illegal activity, including mainly drug trafficking, as well as loan sharking, gambling, money laundering, among many other things. However, fast forward 7 years and Niccolo Rizzuto got sentenced to 5 years in prison after being convicted of cocaine trafficking in Venezuela. This is when Niccolo handed the family business over to his son, Vito, and also when things started to really pick up for their organization. Vito transformed the Rizzuto crime family from a nationwide criminal organization into a multi-billion dollar international organized crime empire that had connections and business all over North America, South America, Europe, Asia, and Australia. 
Rosudo had strong alliances and relationships with several mafia crime families, as well as connections with many street kings. However, his main relationships were with the five families in New York, along with what is said to be the most powerful and dangerous Italian criminal organization in the entire world. They were said to supply the Rosudo crime family with hitmen, soldiers, spies, weapons, bombs, drugs, and money, and would support them in a turf war against an enemy. Vito's dominance got to the point where he was basically the mediator for all organized crime in Montreal who oversaw the peace with the Hells Angels, the Mafia, street gangs, Mexican drug cartels, Colombian drug cartels, and the Irish mob. One time even causing the Hells Angels and Rock Machine MC to create a truce and start working together on Vito's orders. Rizzuto controlled a massive criminal empire that imported and distributed tons of cocaine, heroin, and many other drugs all across Canada, as well as the rest of the world. They also laundered hundreds of millions of dollars, were lending out millions of dollars for the loan sharking business, and made obscene profits from fraud, illegal gambling, and contract killings. He was said to essentially control all of Canada, with Montreal being especially locked down. And this is convenient for him, since a part of Montreal is one of the main importing sites for drugs to be sold in the United States. And of course, Vito seemingly had complete control over it. Once a shipment of drugs reached Montreal, his people would drive the narcotics through back roads and into New York City, the world's top market for cocaine. And apparently his business was very profitable, since on February 11th, 2005, an arrest warrant was issued in Rome against Vito, in connection to the Mafia's alleged plans to launder money through building a multi-billion dollar bridge, connecting Italy's mainland with Sicily. Though the FBI considers the family connected to the Bonanno crime family and Vito to only be one of their soldiers, Canadian law enforcement considers it a completely separate crime family, and Vito is considered by Canadian officials to be the most powerful mob boss in the country. Organized crime authors consider the strength of the Rizzuto clan to rival that of any of the five families in New York, and dubbed it the Sixth Family. As I touched on earlier, a large part of Vito's skill was the ability to pull together many rival crime groups who otherwise would be competing against each other. What Rizzuto created was something structured and business-like. Under his leadership, criminal groups such as the Haitian Street Kings, Hispanic Cocaine Traffickers, Irish Kings, the Hells Angel, and Rock Machine MC, as well as different mafias would all work together to profit off of their similar business ventures. Brazil convinced them that there was enough money for everyone, and that there was no need for violence amongst each other. It would basically work like this. The mafia would get involved with the importation process, since they had international contacts to arrange large shipments of cocaine from South America. Then the outlaw motorcycle gangs would mostly be in charge of the distribution, and then the street gangs would sell them. This made everyone happy, since they could all peacefully get a cut of the lucrative drug business. As could be expected from someone from his profession, Vito rarely spoke with the media, but in a rare case when he did, he described himself as a mediator. He said, quote unquote, people come to me to solve disputes because they believe in me. They have respected me. He was known to go to golf courses with government officials, businessmen, street gangs, and other mafia families. Reports also say that he preferred to see himself as a gentleman rather than an aggressive criminal. He didn't need to raise his voice or lose his cool to make life-changing or fatal decisions towards someone's life. A thing about Vito was that he wanted to make money, serious money, and he knew that to achieve this goal of his, working with people outside of the family, including people of all backgrounds, would be very beneficial. Traditionally, most mafias are strict about the background of its members, but Vito made sort of a multicultural organization. However, there was a cost of joining. Because once you were a part of it, he was the boss and you now worked for him. From here, his influence on the construction industry in Montreal would grow rapidly, with his mafia attacks on buildings going up to a staggering 30%. Getting all of these rival crime groups to work together lessened the violence towards everyone involved from the rivals, which ultimately led to less attention from the media and police, while everyone was making lots of easy money. Under his control, corruption in Canada was set to hit an all-time high, According to longtime crime writer Antonio Nicasa, quote unquote, instead of using violence, he uses corruption. He didn't have to scare people, he just had to share money. He infiltrated union leaders, he had people in the police agencies and law enforcement agencies, he had politicians, name it, he had it. At this time, it was said that Vito basically got a cut of everything going on in the city, whether it was drugs coming into the city, a building being built, or money being laundered. This was also when he received a reputation for being untouchable by law enforcement being nicknamed as Canada's Teflon Don, since he beat drug charges he was facing on two separate occasions. However, things would start going downhill for him and the Rizzuto crime family in 2004. 
Remember how I mentioned that he and some other men from Montreal went to New York to help with the Bonanno family in 1981 for a mission to murder three of the family's underbosses since they were suspected of plotting a takeover? Well, it turns out that a Bonanno crime family underboss turned into a government informant and told the FBI that Vito was one of the shooters back in the 1981 murder, after law enforcement began cracking down on the Bonanno crime family. And what's even more crazy is that for the first time in the five family's history, the boss at the time testified against one of his associates, meaning that the former boss of the Bernardo crime family, who was actually the one talking to Nicolo and setting up the solution to the issue in his organization, was testifying against Vito Rizzuto, resulting in Vito facing a 20 year prison sentence for a crime he committed 22 years ago. Almost three years later, Vito was charged with racketeering charges and was sentenced to five and a half years in a federal supermax prison in Colorado. When Vito went into jail, his father, the founder of the crime family, temporarily took control once again as a placeholder while he was away. The arrests didn't just stop there though. While the American law enforcement was busy in the states trying to convict members of the Bonanno family in Vito, Canadian law enforcement was busy as well, home in Canada. The RCMP were working on a major investigation targeting the Rizzuto crime family, dubbed Project Khaleesi. They recorded thousands of hours of conversations by secretly setting up hidden cameras and microphones at many places the Rizzuto crime family regularly conducted their business. And in 2009, the RCMP finally arrested a total of 70 people associated with the Rizzuto crime family, including Niccolo. Niccolo pleaded guilty to possession of the proceeds of crime in association with the criminal organization and was released from jail two years later. However, things got even worse for the Rizzuto family after Niccolo was released because around half a year later, they weren't only being targeted by law enforcement anymore. Turns out a power struggle was taking place between rival families that were trying to take over Montreal's crime scene since Vito was in prison and the Rizzuto family was vulnerable. It all started when a close family associate was shot and killed, as well as Vito's son, Nick Jr., being murdered in broad daylight shortly after. And a few months after that, Vito's brother-in-law went missing and has still never been found. Even after this, more and more people connected to the family kept getting killed. But the last high-profile killing that took place before Vito's release was his father, Nicolo's. Seeming like something straight out of a movie, he was shot by a sniper through his home's window in front of his daughter and wife, very similar to how Rocco Violi was murdered decades before. He was 86 years old. Less than two years after his father's murder, Vito was back on the streets after being released from a supermax American prison. And you can bet that hearing about all the gruesome deaths of his family members and close associates over the years and not being able to do anything about it caused him to have a lot of pent up anger and a strong need for revenge, which is exactly what he acted upon. Only a month after his release, people who were thought to be rivals with the Rizzutos or traitors were turning up dead one after another. About another three months later, it appeared that Vito was taking back control of organized crime in the city once again. Apparently the groups that were profiting off of Vito being away received an offer from him that basically said that he doesn't care about money anymore, but is only looking for revenge and wants blood from those who went up against his family. Many people joined because they no longer needed to share profits with him, since he didn't care about trying to make money anymore. It is said that over a dozen people were killed shortly after his release. However, his story would come to an end very soon, because in the December of 2013 and 67 years old, he collapsed in his home from lung cancer that he'd been secretly fighting, and would officially die due to pneumonia on December 23rd. The violence wouldn't end quite yet though, since the Rizzuto crime family and its loyalists kept fighting going on to this day. It's said that the war has claimed more than 100 lives and counting. RCMP intelligence states that no other leader has been capable of getting many groups in the city to work together, which is leading to street kings becoming more powerful, as well as the mafia clans in Montreal not being on friendly terms, leading to there being no clear leader and an unstable situation in Montreal's organized crime scene. Vito's and the rest of his family story was obviously a very insane one, considering how much influence he had in Montreal, Canada as a whole, and even the entire world. He had the impressive ability to bring together rival groups and get them to work together peacefully, in a way that benefited everyone involved while staying out of trouble and in control for a decade that no one in Canada has really even come close to replicating. He's known by many as Canada's most notorious gangster of all time. Please drop a like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video and want to see more in the future, it helps out the channel so much. Leave a comment letting me know what you want to see next, feedback or just general thoughts on the story. Thanks for watching and have a good one.